If you're determined to age well, then you, my friend, are in the right place because that's why we're here, to age well. Bloody well, in fact. Welcome to the Aging Project podcast. I'm Shelley Craft, your host and fellow ager, and in each episode, we'll dive into the nitty gritty of what it takes to age well, learning from experts around the world and, of course, from each other. Why? Because aging well doesn't just happen, my friends, and each of us needs and deserves a support team. So you can think of us as your tribe or perhaps your cheerleaders. We're here to stand by your side, to propel you forward and spark yes, you can choices at every age. We'd love for you to join our growing community. In fact, we're calling it a movement. And of course, try our free five day morning challenge over at theagingproject.com. It is a great place to start your aging journey. And this is a great place to kick off today's episode. Brought to you by youmusttryit.com, where you'll find supplements, skincare, and makeup. We've tried it, we've tested Tested it and we love it, and it's all in one place. Periodontitis or gum disease, you know, we say that it just happens later in, on in life. Well, our ancestors did not lose their teeth. You can dig up jaw bones that are um, that are complete with thirty-two teeth, including wisdom teeth. They, they, their teeth did not fall out. Um, that's a sign of very poor health later in life if your teeth have fallen out. That was this week's guest, Dr. Stephen Lin, who's about to blow your mind. Stephen is a world-leading functional dentist, speaker and author, The Dental Diet Functional Dentist. He's also the founder of Helix Dentistry located in Sydney. Stephen is about to literally transform your age-old beliefs about the mouth and its importance to your health. Most of us understand the importance of our heart or our brain, but not our mouth. Why has tooth decay, crooked teeth and sleep apnea become an epidemic around the world for both adults and kids? Surely more drilling, more fillings, braces and sleep apnea machines aren't the answer. They're a quick fix, costly solution. But why and what's the connection between our mouth and our future health? Like the medical industry, Stephen argues dentistry has been focused on treatment and not prevention. But thanks to holistic or functional dentists like Stephen, things are changing. If snoring, grinding, tooth decay, gum disease, sleep apnea are impacting you or someone you love, then this, my friends, is an episode not to be missed. Please welcome Dr. Stephen Lin. Yeah, thanks, Shelley, for having me. And it's so true that the the hidden side of how powerful dental health can be, and especially for things like longevity and, you know, taking control of really stubborn health issues that can actually creep up up on us before we know, because issues in the mouth actually represent a long-standing problem in the body that if we actually stop and take a look at what's happening with our teeth and our gums and so forth, you can actually see problems long before they happen in the body. So it's been a really fascinating journey for myself. And Dr. Berhent has been one of those leaders that I really, um, you know, that has been pushing this this kind of message that the mouth is so important. So how did you go? Let's hear a bit about your story. Obviously, you started uh, studying normal dentistry, shall we say, traditional Western dentistry. How did you then move into holistic dentistry? Yeah, so I, I studied um, biomedical science and then I, I did a postgraduate uh, degree in um, dentistry. I, I finished that and, you know, it's a lot of university work. So you're kind of like, ah, oh, you, you think that your life is going to kind of, kind of be complete and smooth from there. But I got out into the world as a practicing dentist and you, you know, you start to learn all these skills. It's a very uh, demanding uh, career. You have to learn a lot quickly. Um, and then as my learning curve started to go down a bit, I started to ask some questions. I started to get some kind of nagging questions from patients. You know, why do you know, some of my children have this and why do I present like this? And I didn't find a lot of the answers in traditional textbooks. So it began to bug me a bit that some of the things like, you know, why do crooked teeth occur? Why why do we need to put braces on kids? Why does tooth decay, why is it so prevalent in society today? Some of the, the answers to that weren't as clear as what I would like. And then so... <laughs> What I did is I actually questioned whether I could be a dentist the rest of my life, just patching things up. I felt like I was just, you know, veneering over the problem. And then so I took some time off and I was traveling through Europe and I came across a book called Nutrition and Physical Degeneration. And that's by a, a dentist named Weston A. Price. And this dentist had the theory that the 
Um, the issues he was seeing in his clinic, which was in the 20s in um, Cleveland, Ohio, uh, was actually underpinned by the modern diet. And he went around the world to prove that. And he took photos of all the places he went to. And he found that uh, in the populations that took on the modern diet that were eating traditionally for, um, for generations and generations, they they had dental disease in one generation after eating that modern diet. So de dental disease, including no, no decay and straight wide dental arches, existed for generations before that. In one um, generation of eating the modern diet, you see this deterioration in teeth, including crooked teeth. So you don't see crooked teeth. And this is a big thing for me. It's like, well, you know, the, it's the idea that diet regulates the, the growth and development of the jaw that was a big kind of mind-opening, you know, um, area for me. So I felt that I had to dive into that. And so how was that information received around the world? Uh, obviously, this book that came out, was it received well or were people like, oh, you're kidding me, you, your diet can't affect the shape of your jaw? Well, Price was actually the founder of the research arm of the American Dental Association. Um, and so he was actually a very big figure at the time and he was called the, the Charles Darwin of Nutrition when it was first published, but he died in the 40s and his work fell out of uh, favour. He did some other publications on root canals and this wasn't taken so well by his peers. And so his work actually was, was basically di um, dismissed in the 40s and then lost. And then so it took probably 70 years for um, a foundation um, in America to kind of rediscover that and reprint all his work. And now we're starting, and so the book I have published, The Dental Diet, um, basically underpins all the scientific uh, validation of his work that we've actually been witnessing the whole thing happening and his work was unfortunately lost. It's incredible, isn't it? Because we've often spoken about that uh, separation between perhaps medicine and dentistry and why they became two separate industries altogether that, that really seem to have zero relation to each other now. And yet you're saying go back only a few um, decades and it really was the fact that everything had to work together and your mouth was certainly a part of your overall body and your microbiome was absolutely uh, committed and, and, you know, in relation to the rest of your body. That separation that happened was obviously detrimental to both causes, to, to medical and to dentistry. Yeah, that's been a bit of an issue, you know, that I've noticed since practicing dentistry is we are very siloed and segmented in the way we, we operate. And, you know, we don't talk to our medical colleagues very much. And it is largely because of the way we are set up to see kind of our, you know, our little window of, of a patient, which is the mouth. Um, but then the same thing, the doctors are perhaps, you know, um, missing things that are staring right at them with their, you know, with the, the teeth and oral health of their patients and that some collaboration, you know, really does help. And that's been a big re rewarding part of building a functional dental practice is that we look at the whole picture and we try to plug into what the patient is experiencing, you know, elsewhere in the body so that we can, you know, push them forward on a healing path instead of just patching over things. So do you find the patients that come to you are aware and a little bit more enlightened about functional dentistry or did it start that they were just in your local area and now they're sort of um, sh shouting from the rafters how important functional dentistry is compared to traditional dentistry? Yeah, we have a mix. We have, this is, this area has actually developed a lot in the last year or two. It's actually you know, really kind of risen. We've been um, uh, practicing here for, since 2018 and my book published in 2018. And then, so I found that there was a small gathering of people that, that knew this area and they were looking for answers. And this is a very small segment of the population looking for answers of problems they had through their dental health. And they were coming to us. So we had you kind of your real diehards that had gone deep into research that was very underground at the time but since has grown. So we do have, I would say probably um, between 20 to 30% of our patients are very aware of this kind of thing and they are seeking out these kind of treatments. So in terms of their materials that we use, you know, um, removing any kind of toxicities, um, understanding nutrient deficiencies, that's really important. But something that we also look at is the airway and breathing at night, which is very, very impactful for both oral health, but also systemic health. Um, and that's something that we focus on a lot and, and a lot of people um, are, are becoming aware of that both in children and also 
um, in adult age groups as well because breathing is important for everyone. And then you've got your kind of people that are a little bit more aware, but there is, um, but there's, uh, you know, probably levels to it. You know, maybe they want their mercuries out or maybe they're asking about an infected root canal or, you know, how that affects their risk, inflammatory risk in the body. So there's a different subset of people, but it's absolutely grown, Shelley, in the, in the last year or two, but it, it's kind of been a long, a long haul. People haven't been talking about it for, for quite some time. All right. Well, let's start at the very beginning. How about we bust a couple of myths that people have believed about their mouth and teeth for a long time and how holistic dentistry has changed that. So what, what's the most common belief that one of your adult patients might have about the mouth that just isn't true? So I would say that the, the biggest belief um, that we, that we, that is commonly known about dentistry is that tooth decay is caused by sugar. And so whilst sugar is a, a huge factor for tooth decay, the core reason why we get decay is our deficiencies and primarily in the nutrient vitamin D. So vitamin D deficiency as a root cause for tooth decay should really be the first thing that comes to mind. Yes, we need to look at our sugar consumption, but vitamin D deficiency is the first thing we should think if a tooth or in in any of our children or family um, has tooth decay, we should be thinking about deficiencies. And these can run into other deficiencies too, like things like trace minerals, iron, magnesium that the body uses to, to place minerals into teeth. But vitamin D is number one, and that's what we really should be seeing tooth decay as. My goodness. So you could then deep dive into the fact that, yes, if... Um rotting teeth are a family thing, that this is generational, that this is hereditary. It could be that your entire um, genetics has a deficiency in iron or ability to absorb vitamin D. So then, of course, everyone in your family, it's not necessarily related to your diet at all. It could be the fact that that's the way your genetics are set up. Well, the interesting thing about vitamin D is that there are, you know, probably, you know, 20 to 30,000 receptors for vitamin D on through the body. And that includes your gut, your, your respiratory system, your brain has two to 300 receptors for vitamin D. Um, so when we are deficient, the body starts to get signals that there's not much vitamin D around, and then it all starts to deteriorate. And that's what tooth decay is, is that the body is lacking the vitamin D to place the, the minerals into bones and it's not using the cofactors. Um, but one of the biggest factors for vitamin D deficiency now is the risk of Alzheimer's dementia. So um, so the decline in, um, in brain function is likely, you know, underpinned through a long-term deficiency in vitamin D, which began with the teeth problems earlier. Vitamin D deficiency can, um, can present as gum disease as well. And that's related to vitamin A because vitamin D and vitamin A are the, the transmitters of light. So we absorb vitamin, um, light through vitamin A in the eye and we absorb vitamin D through our skin, through cholesterol in the skin. And they meet in the brain to form serotonin and melatonin. So these, these processes are drastically impacted over our life, which could relate to the literature is suggesting that vitamin D deficiency is a big driver of um, cognitive decline in aging uh, populations. Gosh, and you can tell that from someone's teeth. See, I told you, I told you all listeners that he would blow your mind and that has blown my mind. I mean, that's right. It's, it's, Something that we can, so all of the, what we do in the clinic is we, we think, okay, so if we have a problem or we have a history of problems with, with dental diseases, we need to think in deficiencies and what long-term effect that's going to have. And one of the biggest, um, impacts as well is that the, um, and which goes on probably to, you know, our, our next point is that the, the jaw development is also underpinned in the deficiencies of these nutrients as well. So when you have an underdeveloped jaw, you have a craniofacial system and an airway that doesn't function very well. And so you don't breathe well at night, you grind your teeth, um, you sometimes snore, your tongue falls back into your throat and your brain stars of oxygen. And you can measure this on the polysomnograph. So if you go to, a, if, um, you know, you go to a sleep study, they will measure your brain waves and they'll measure your uh, blood oxygen and they'll measure what you're doing while you're breathing. And what they show is that as you breathe um, less during your sleep, so you pause or, or even just grinding um, uh, moments, then your blood oxygen decreases. And this starves the brain of oxygen and is a very strong link to cognitive decline in, in aging um, populations. And sleep apnea now has a billion people on the planet 
which is underpinned by this shrinking jaw. So our jaw shrinks um, over you know a couple of generations, as Price showed us, and then we can't breathe, and then we choke in our sleep, sometimes silently. Women do it silently. Men snore and choke so that the whole house hears. But women do it silently, and then they, they have the same effects that become sleep apnea. So it's really important to understand that, otherwise it can become cognitive decline. Did you know six of the biggest women's health challenges have one thing in common, and that is gut health. So if weight, sleep, hormones, fatigue, sore joints, and anxiety are bothering you, then join us for an eye-opening Tap Talk Masterclass on gut health. It's happening Sunday, 7th of April at 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll be coming to you live from the Aging Project's private recording studio for one day and one day only, and we'd love for you to join us. This is a 90-minute session with me and clinical nutritionist, Lindsay Kosh. You'll learn how to create gloriously good gut health. Plus, you'll receive a 10-page gut health game plan workbook, which is filled with everything you need to get started. Think daily checklists, there's recipes, and so much more. Don't fret, if you cannot make the recording, it will be made available to those who can't join us on the day. Ladies, I really want you to think about investing in your overall health, your gut health, so much more important than eyebrows, nails and skin. For just $39.95, secure your Tap Talk ticket over at theagingproject.com. We are counting down the days. We cannot wait to see you there. It's going to be a great session. So literally opening your mouth is like opening a can of worms, isn't it? It can tell you so much about the inner workings of your body, your health, your overall system function, not just about whether they're white and shiny. Absolutely, absolutely. You know, we, we, we have great uh, methods in modern dentistry to kind of make teeth white and shiny, but the real value is in a true understanding of your body. And, you know, if we're looking to optimize, one thing that I've found is using all this information for myself has been, you know, the, the most powerful, you know, health transformation I've gone through because I've been able to, you know, find these really powerful ways to change my own health just through preventative techniques. And so this is, through nutrients, through breathing, better sleep, and then finding that, you know, actually you don't have to go through kind of your decline in, in later years. So what does your routine look like now coming from a professional? What What is your morning mouth routine? The first things I do, and this is um, really important, is that I, I take a, a, a big focus on cleaning both the mouth, which is, you know, I love, you know, salt water and uh, I, I use a hydro, hydroxyapatite toothpaste, but I take also the same amount of time to kind of clear my nose. So that's a, a salt water rinse up through, in and out through the nose. Um, and that's to make sure that I'm, I'm nasal breathing at night. So um, one of the things I do is I take my lips at night to make sure that I'm not, uh, I don't have any uh, mouth breathing during the night. And that, that's making sure that nitric oxide is um, bathing my, uh, my respiratory system and making sure oxygen is getting to my brain. Um, and then I'm clearing all the, the nasal sinus by doing, you know, a breathing technique and, and the and the sinus rinse to make sure those uh, sinuses stay clear. It's very impactful. All of the patients I see, even some of the ones that aren't um, unaware of it, have breathing and and often it it, it um, expresses in grinding, so teeth grinding. If you're grinding your teeth, it means you're not breathing well, and that was an issue I was having. So optimizing your sleep and breathing like that is very important. Some people need help with that structurally, um, but you can do your own work. The other way is to strengthen the tongue. And this is really important, Shelley, because the tongue is one of the main medias of the of the craniofacial system. It keeps your neck toned. It keeps your airway toned. It keeps everything functioning here. And the main goal of that is to keep the tongue suction to the roof of the mouth when you're sleeping unconsciously. Because if your tongue stays there, if you feel, if you do that and you try to breathe through the mouth, you try to breathe through the mouth that with your tongue sealed, you can't do it. It's, you cannot breathe through the mouth because it's sealed to the roof of the mouth. And what that does is if you look at a scan, you'll see down the oropharynx there, all of the muscles open up like a, like a tent when the tongue is up and posteriorly as well. Singers are very good at this because they tone this whole system. 
Um, and what that does is supports your oropharyngeal area to be open always during, um, during daytime and sleep. It, it helps your posture. So it stops you from slumping. So it stops us getting these kind of curvatures of the, the upper neck, which is very common as we age because our posture isn't very good. And then it helps us. Sw- so swallowing then becomes the, the director of posture. Every time you swallow, it should be that upwards and backwards motion. And it just prompts us to sit up again and be straight and keep our spine straight which is very important for everything. It's important for lymphatic drainage. Um, it's important for, um, you know, to lo- so we don't get postural compensations and issues with the body, which as a practicing dentist, I was suffering with a couple of years ago. I was getting neurological pain down my shoulder. Well, fixing my posture and fixing my joints really helps that. But the tongue is actually the mediator and knowing that the tongue, even through exercise, should be sealed to the, to the roof of the mouth. So a nasal breathing through exercise is a what was a very transformative um, method to put into my daily routine. Oh my goodness! All right, so so tongue position as well. So on the top of your palate, pushing up, there's a bit of pressure there. That's right. And should it be close to your teeth or sort of back from the from the back of your teeth? That's right. So the two points we're thinking, Shelley, is the the spot of gum just behind the upper front teeth. So just on the palate. So that's where the tip of the tongue goes. Then the, if you use your finger now and put it to the roof of your mouth. And feel where the soft palate is. And it's a long way back. We feel the soft palate. That's where the back of the tongue should be sealing. So the back of the tongue, so we, that's, should, should be going right. So it's like a very deep lifting. God, that's going to take some practice. That's right. It takes practice because if you look at an anatomical model of all those muscles, there are many, many muscles that go down the neck. And so what you'll feel this kind of tiredness when you're doing it. That's those muscles that haven't been toned. And these are these deep, oropharyngeal airway muscles that support your your airway during sleep that we have intuitively lost our connection to. So when you train the back of the tongue, it actually primes the a nerve, a cranial nerve in the brain called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve runs down into the gut and people are talking about vagal tone, very important to stay healthy in the gut. Many other different organs like the liver and kidneys and so forth require vagal tone, but also to in for breathing and calmness is very important to have good vagal tone because it means your cranial nerves are functioning properly. Well, the, one, the first way to improve your vagal tone is to is to strengthen the back of your tongue because those muscles are, are innervated by deeper muscles um, that are guided both by the vagus nerve, the glossopharyngeal nerve and others. Unbelievable. So this is also leads to, and I saw it on your Instagram, the mewing. Mewing? Is this mewing or is mewing something different? No, mewing is a, um, is an appropriation of this. That's right. So, so mewing is, a, uh, was originated by John Mew, who was an orth- um, orthopedic surgeon in, um, in the UK and his son, Mike, um, they've both been advocating for this idea that tongue posture affects um, orthodontic outcomes. And orthodontists do know this because they put things like tongue guards in to stop um, to stop the tongue from touching their, their beautiful teeth that they're arranging. But the reality is that the tongue is guiding all this. And so when you don't correct a child's tongue posture, um, you will often get orthodontic regression. So they're saying basically that we should be considering these factors for, um, for how we treat orthodontic patients and maybe intervene earlier rather than just treating things with, with braces and he's kind of come across a little bit of flack for that but the term mewing is the idea of exercising your tongue and he actually um he actually got millions and millions of views on youtube because of adolescent teenagers boys mainly wanting to do his exercises for chiseled facial facial features like the hollywood kind of angled jaw and there's a lot of before and afters on the, the internet of you know 17 year old boys doing this mewing and having this transformation where you do see quite a, a difference in the shape of it and the, the tone of their face. So this is both their cheekbones and the jaw. So if we want to keep that kind of tone as we grow up and as we, as something that we both that supports the airway, tongue posture is really important for that. Wow. Okay. So we're, we're taking care of our tongue and everyone, I do really encourage you to jump, jump on Dr. Stephen Lynn's, um, Instagram because he does amazing stories, great reels. There's lots of fabulous diagrams there to show how all this works. And we'll, of course, put it in our show notes as well. But that tongue position is vital, obviously, to well-being, but of course, um, 
oral health, body health, overall health. This is crazy. All right, you were talking about yourself then, obviously, and the things that you do. Have you had um, a patient story that you can share with us that was either something that inspired you um, or that was an incredible transformation um, in the way that they took care of their own health that you could share with us? Yeah, absolutely. Well, the um, Probably the one that sticks out, um, is an elderly couple that uh, came to me via um, via recommendation. They were actually doing um, Daniel Bresden's um, uh, reverse uh, Alzheimer's program, and we've had lucky enough to chat to him. Also, yes, yes, very clever man. He's and, and he, what he talks about is the is the reversibility of Alzheimer's dementia, and I love his philosophy and this idea that we actually control and look at what we're doing. And um, uh, we we came in, and so what they do though is that is in um, Dr. Bresden's program is that they are very switched on to the fact that hey, anything in your mouth is going to increase you, these things that we're trying to measure in the body that give you risk of dementia. And so basically, they do all their checks and and um, and they try and do their basic kind of dietary changes and supplements and so forth. When they when they receive a kind of um, a blockage point where they're not getting anywhere, they'll say, look, do you have any kind of dental history? Do you have any mercury amalgams or do you have root canal treatments or, or sleep apnea? And then they start to go on this screening process and then they were doing this remotely, so they came to us for this. Um, and they were a little bit kind of exhausted at that stage. They, they'd done a lot of supplementation. They'd done a lot of um, dietary change and they were you know, maybe perhaps feeling stuck in the way their progress was going. Um, but then, so we did find in both of them, um, so in, um, in the husband, he had a, a mouth full of these mercury fillings and some old infected root canal treatments. Um, and his inflammatory markers in the body were very high. So we went through a process. He was a very healthy guy, but it, it was like this burden in his mouth was really weighing him down. And so we did a process of getting all of the, the metals and everything out and the infected teeth. And his progress in, in the um, in the program actually skyrocketed. He he went really well from that. All his his memory markers and all his testing was really good. And he was, yeah, it was like he was being stuck by his mouth. Um, but his wife was similar as well. But she didn't have this. She didn't have these things in her mouth. She didn't have the the metal fillings. And we were a little bit puzzled by her to start with. But then we took a CBCT scan, which is a three D modeling of the. Um, of the jaw, we can see everything. And then what we can do is uh, measure the airway. And what we found is that she had a very small um, oropharyngeal airway, almost like a straw to the back of her throat. And she she reported, you know, somewhat an- an- anxiety-like symptoms, you know, maybe tipping on slightly depression. Um, and then this kind of showed us that she had uh, quite a, a, a science, uh, sleep disorder. She was grinding in her teeth. But we could see her airway wasn't working very well. So we actually designed a custom um, splint to support her airway at night. And within months, her, her, um, her um, results went similarly to her husband. So she was not diagnosed for sleep apnea. She had a sleep apnea test. But the issue with polysomnographs is that they don't measure women very well. They don't measure women and kids very well. They're only looking for sleep apnea in kind of overweight males, um, that's that's kind of the main area where you get a good diagnostic outcome from a polysomnograph. Otherwise, the women and the kids kind of go a little bit under the radar and they're grinding their teeth. They're having the same respiratory um, distress during sleep and they're having the same effect on their brain and their body, but they're not being picked up. And so that's where um, a, a more deep, a deeper analysis of what's actually happening with their structure and their tongue, the, the width of their palate, um, so that we know whether they, sometimes an ear, nose and throat surgeon can really help as well. So if we know they're breathing better, then we feel the difference in, in better quality sleep and then the outcomes so that we're hopefully preventing that dementia down the track. Unbelievable. So the two of them went away with a, a fresh look on, A, oral health, of course, um, but also on, on their sleep and that was affecting their cognitive function, that was affecting their overall health. Um, right down to, again, just the size of your airway. That it, How are you ever going to know to measure that unless you've got someone guiding you through that this could be a problem? That's right. That's right. It, it's a very hidden area of what we say medicine is that, you know, the idea for sleep apnea, for instance, um, is, is one that has kind of jumped up. So when I trained 
sleep apnea wasn't taught very well to, you know, to dental students and even, even medical students, you know, you have to go and do continuing education to, to actually, um, you know, understand what sleep apnea is, but then sleep apnea is treated with a CPAP machine by sleep physicians. And it's, you know, barely 50% of people that will tolerate a, and have a good outcome with a, with a CPAP machine. Um, there are ways to kind of treat this orally with, with splints. And so, or the other route is to do things like the mewing and the tongue training um, and the orofacial um, guidance therapy to help build the structure and build long-term um, better breathing for, um, you know, for sleep, which is so important because there are a billion people on the planet. However, there's probably another billion who are flying under the radar and these are probably your, um, you know, your female age groups, you know, people that are more slenderly built, slight necks. I see it a lot in people who have had previous orthodontic treatment. So they're, they've had orthodontic treatment that have perhaps extracted teeth and retracted the face. Um, that is a big risk because in those people, when we do the scan, we see a tiny little airway um, that has a great smile, but they're really not breathing at night and they are feeling it. So would you suggest, obviously, anyone um, from, you know, kids right through to middle age should obviously be working on our tongue position um, and strengthening our, our muscles and, of course, keeping our jaw strong. Anyone who has, I guess, um, been in the system for a while, they're, they're in our older age group, perhaps they're on a sleep apnea machine, do you suggest that they go and see somebody else, get a second opinion? Um, because obviously if you're on a machine, this is for a, a lifetime, this is every night for the rest of your life, that if that's the solution that you've been given, is it is it too late for those people to perhaps make some dramatic changes or, you know, are they destined to be on that machine to get a good night's sleep forever? Yeah, it's a good question. The, a CPAP machine is a good tool for certain people because some people need to get that restful sleep with the machine. However, some people are being, uh, being given these machines in their thirties. So, you know, and they, this does not work well socially, you know, having to put a machine on, um, you know, whether it's your partner or whether it's, 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 um, new relationships or anything like that. So there's usually a, a time in life where, you know, a CPAP machine is not, um, not very convenient. So if I would say the CPAP machines, if they've been prescribed by the doctor, they continue to use it. However, if they are looking for a path off, understanding their risks, so for instance, a narrow palate or an underdeveloped um, uh, underdeveloped lower jaw, so that a bite that sits back, so, so when we have the, the upper, jaw, upper teeth sitting forward, is a big risk for this airway being um, being closed. And, so the, and that can actually be orthodontically um, kind of masked as well, where if they've had previous ortho, you won't see the kind of the actual impact on their airway. But those people can have structural analysis and we can put them into something that, that holds the airway open during the night um, as a way to ramp off. And then there is a ways to ramp off these splints as well. And that's via what we've talked about, Shelley, the, the strengthening of the tongue. We can do widening therapy in adults. So we can, you know, slowly, not as not as quickly as you can um, widen a child, which we can do quite dramatically. Um, but you can do, I've done palatal expansion. So I've worn a guard for about 18 months to widen my palate. And the reason why I did that is, you know, both for the, the improvement of the airway, um, but to improve the space where my tongue can seal up there is to help this whole process. Because if we think of prices work, like our jaws have collapsed. So when we build this physiological um, distance in our palate, there are widespread um, benefits through the body. My goodness. All right. Well, let's now focus on diet because I know this is the specialty of yours, The Dental Diet, fabulous book, which was really about the impact of oral health but also on our bone health, our gut health, our immune function, brain health. What is The Dental Diet? Yeah, so The Dental Diet is the, the, the journey that I went on after finding Price's work. And so what Price showed is he actually looked at what human cultures used to eat for generations all over the world. So he looked at, you know, 12 different um, cultures, what they ate, and he found that in every single human um, human cuisine were was the focus on fat-heavy, fat-soluble vitamins. He found that the modern diet is deficient in fat-soluble vitamins. That was his con conclusion after going around the world and, and observing all these populations. And he measured the nutrient levels of these um, vitamin foods in vitamin A, vitamin D, and one other nutrient that he, he 
he identified as being key and roughly 10 to 20 times richer in the, in the traditional diet. And these came from fat heavy foods. So these were uh, organ meats, which were eaten across the planet and something that we've systematically stripped out of our diet. Um, but the, the, the fatty cuts of meat that have the retinol, the vitamin A and so forth and the vitamin D and vitamin D works with a nutrient that price identified, but died, but never found out. And that's actually vitamin K2 and vitamin K2. If you've heard about some of the, the, there's a little bit of controversy about the effectiveness of vitamin D in, in the medical literature. Um, now the problem with that is that they give vitamin D as a supplement and they give it with calcium. And that the, the results aren't very effective. They show that the increase in bone density um, isn't significant for certain populations when you do that. But in Jap- Japan and some Eastern um, European countries, they've been using vitamin D and the nutrient called vitamin K2, which is the, the nutrient that Price found but never identified, for some years now. And what K2 does is activates proteins that carry calcium into bones and teeth. We have it in our saliva. It's called MGP. Um, matrix GLA protein and osteocalcin. And what this protein does is it carries the calcium into our bones and teeth. So if you get a calculus buildup, a calcified plaque buildup on your teeth, it means your body isn't efficiently placing calcium into your gums and teeth. It shouldn't be building up on your teeth. Your hygienist shouldn't have to clean it off, but you do need to get it cleaned off if it's there. But if it's there, we should be thinking we need more K2 because vitamin K2 pairs with vitamin D activates matrix GLA protein and osteocalcin, puts the calcium into bones and teeth. And the studies actually show as well is that people that have vitamin D and calcium uh, increase their coronary um, heart risk because of the calcification through the, the cardiovascular vessels. So when we don't have K2, we don't have that vitamin D pair. So vitamin D supplements are helpful, but we need these co-nutrients to put the the minerals where they want to go. And so the dietary models are all about eating fat soluble vitamins. And these are fatty cuts of meat, eggs, um, dairy, um, organ meats, especially. That's something that's price found that every culture, um, focused on. And it's very difficult to do today. Um, but that's something why I've found for, you know, in order to get it into back into our modern diet, we've um, found a desiccated form. Um, and we do a mix of liver, heart and kidney, which is a, a gra- great way to lift um, iron because most, um, most pregnant women, most kids today, and even into the aging population as well, um, we are deficient in iron. And the reason is the cofactors for iron, such as copper, such as vitamin A, uh, such as selenium, um, vitamin C, um, that's how our body absorbs iron. And through breast milk when we're younger, it comes in um, lactoferrin. So it becomes in this biological form that we absorb as babies. In in adulthood, we really need to have iron, not in tablet form or infusion form, which we get if we go to the doctors when we're iron deficient, but coupled with copper and all these other um, nutrients that help us to absorb iodine and vitamin A. Now, they're all found in organ meats, which is why we found that helping um, patients reconnect to this traditional way of, um, of nourishing ourselves, which is through the nose-to-tail eating. Um, you know, and, and it's a little bit kind of difficult today to kind of, Stomach, right? Yeah, I've never really been an innards kind of person myself. I do love pate, I will say. Um, but as far as going back to, to tripe and, and liver and beef and kidney pies and things, um, obviously you've come up with a more digestible way of, of getting that, uh, those supplements into us. Yeah, that's right. That's right. That's absolutely, it, it's difficult. And that was something I went through. I was like, oh, do I really, uh, cause I never grew up on liver. I didn't eat any of those kind of things. We were, we were kind of on the, the modern diet. You know, my parents did, my parents had, you know, um, had these kind of organ meats in their diet. But you kind of have to think of that traditionally, like how far off are, are we, you know, off the, these nutrients? And, um, you know, the the way, you know, we've found is that, you know, we really need this back in our, in our kids' diets. And, you know, I've got young kids. It's hard to make kids eat these kind of things these days. So we we hide it in, um, in things like uh, bolognese and food. Yep. Bolognese. Gee, you can mix anything in with bolognese, can't you? Yeah. <laughs> You can mix anything. That's right. Yeah, you can get lots of capsules in that, um, or, or or you just get the you, you just get the, the liver straight from the butcher and you cut it up and you you have to be. It's it's a little bit sensitive. You cook it too much, it gets a bit tough. 
It's a little bit sticky in the kitchen too, isn't it? And sorry to all the vegans and vegetarians listening, but um, it well, I guess on that, is there a way that you can get these extra vitamins that we have been lacking through a, a vegan or a vegetarian diet? So um, the short answer is unfortunately no. You, you have to supplement on a vegan diet, um, things like B12. Um, one thing that is not very well spoken about is, is vitamin A retinols. You don't get active forms of vitamin A, and most of the population are not very um, efficient converters of beta carotenes, which convert into vitamin A in the body. Um, and so that's one thing that I would say that, um, and there's a host of other nutrients to iodine um, and, you know, a lot of the, the amino acids that you can't get from um, from plants, but also too, you don't get heme iron. So iron comes in the form of heme iron, which is a um, what, what gets absorbed into the blood cell. Uh, and you don't get that from plants. So I don't, think they absorb the iron very well either and and so all the bioactive forms the activated b's like the methyl b12s the methyl folates come in the in the animal forms yeah goodness all right yeah i've just written that list down here and there's no way that you're taking one of those individually every single day so there's a lot more too yes so to find um a supplement that's going to to do that for you that you can as you say if you're not good at swallowing tablets you can empty the capsule out into your meal or your smoothie or whatever it is um i guess we you know things like fish oils we know have have been great for our health for a long time but again it's getting that into us and whether it's a capsule it's always the aftertaste does this does your supplement have a bit of a a meaty brothy aftertaste no it's completely deodorized yes so um yeah so our kids don't notice it in the uh, in their food um yeah so we've the we looked at that because the, some of the tablet forms do have that kind. You can smell the tablet from uh, just by opening the bottle. But ours are completely odorless, which is um, yeah, quite palatable for people that don't. You know, all all the girls at work take it, <laughs> and, and they don't. Well, they would not eat liver. Um, yeah, but so it, it it's definitely you, you don't taste it at all. Struggling with gut health? Well, we got you. The Aging Project is on a mission to improve the gut health of women around the world. Why? Because good gut health is the foundation of great overall health. It is just so important. And yet most of us will prioritise skincare over gut care. We're looking to change that, which is why you're invited to our first Tap Talk Masterclass on gut health. We're bringing our community together inside our private and interactive recording studio for one day only on Sunday, the 7th of April, 9am Eastern Standard Time. This is a 90-minute session with myself and clinical nutritionist, Lindsay Koch. You'll learn how to create gloriously good gut health. Plus, you'll receive a 10-page gut health game plan workbook filled with everything you need to get started. Think daily checklists, recipes, and so much more. The recording will be made available to those who can't make it on the day, so make sure you secure your spot now and you'll receive a free copy of our Buy Buy Belly Fat workbook. It is our way of saying thank you for being part of our journey and for investing in your health. Tickets are limited, so secure yours now before they're gone. We are on the countdown. We cannot wait to see you there. It's fascinating, isn't it? Because it really probably is only two generations um, that have moved away from this diet that you're describing. It's not long. It's not going to be hard for us to undo. Um, It just takes a little bit of practice and a little bit of forward thinking. Um, Again, you think, okay, well, I'm having a well-rounded diet, but obviously there's still elements that have been missing. Absolutely. Yeah. So, and that's, that's the key point, Shelley, is that even people that are, you know, doing their best with what we call a, a good diet today, they are unfortunately a little bit away from what our body actually needs and so one of the things that i did for a long time was i did high dose supplementation in these nutrients so i did twenty thousand iu of vitamin d a day and i still do that every day i took high dose vitamin a as well daily with k2 and i took these nutrients um for years because the if you look at the literature it shows that we we have been deficient for some time it takes time to build this up your body needs to re- sequester these nutrients and one of the the things that i'm seeing a lot in the practice today is that 
I'm seeing a lot of women who are um, being going into their bone uh, mineral density tests and being told that they have osteoporosis and they need to go onto the, a medication. Um, now, these medications can be quite dangerous for dental treatment, so they are often referred to a dentist first because if you have a tooth extraction while you're on, on an osteoporosis medication, you'll actually get quite a bad bone infection or you'll be at higher risk for that. Um, so a lot of women being diagnosed by the doctor saying they have osteoporosis, you need to go onto a medication. But they're not being um, monitored for their vitamin D levels and their, their other, um, you know, uh, cofactors, which such as iron and so forth, and definitely not vitamin K2. So what we usually do is try and send them back to see what their vitamin D levels are. And we find that, you know, if, if their bone density levels are not that, um, you know, they're not that severe at this stage, you know, getting back on track and monitoring your vitamin D levels. And even in Australia, Shelley, we are still um, deficient in vitamin D. Um, and so it's something that everyone should have a really good hold of what their level is at. Um, if they are supplementing, they should always supplement with vitamin K2. Um, and then we should be thinking about these other co-nutrients like iron and magnesium and so forth that help and sequester vitamin D in the body as well. Unbelievable. So that's good for your overall, again, gut health, body health, general health. Um, what, what can you tell from a mouth about chronic disease? Um, obviously, again, your microbiome and your mouth biome is this amazing gateway to the rest of your body. But what can you actually tell um, from a mouth about perhaps oncoming chronic diseases? Yes. Yeah, so chronic diseases usually, in, in, in my experience, underpin uh, a, a more sinister underlying um, process. So what we try and do is, you know, you take a person's medical history, you look at some, often chronic disease will present with something along the lines of loss of some kind of tissue in the mouth. So like a gum recession. So you lose the, the gums, but then you lose the bone. So you'll, you'll have a chronic loss of bone and some people will have it in one area of the mouth. Some people will have it systemically. Uh, in the mouth. So they'll have um, loose teeth and some people will lose their teeth in their late 30s to early 40s. Um, and that's something that, you know, we also know too is that, that um, periodontitis or gum disease, you know, we say that it just happens later in, on in life. Well, our ancestors did not lose their teeth. You can dig up jaw bones that are, um, that are complete with 32 teeth, including wisdom teeth. They, they, their teeth did not fall out. Um, that's a sign of very poor health later in life if your teeth have fallen out. And so we often find the deterioration of tissues like that in the mouth that indicate a chronic inflammation um, process and that is linked in the literature to heart issues. So if you have um, bugs that are causing gum disease, these bugs can increase your risk of, of cardiovascular disease. And some people need to take a, if they've had a you know, certain cardiovascular um issues that they they need to take an antibiotic before a dental treatment because the the bacteria flush through the body um, may increase their risk of a myocarditis but the really interesting one is when you find these these periodontal um, pathogens in in the oral microbiome they've just recently linked these to alzheimer's dementia so the the presence of porphyrmonas gingivitis which is one of the, the main bacteria found in gum disease which breaks down the gums and bone um, is found uh, in in the brain as well, so it goes through the body and we it, it links into cognitive decline. So, long term gum disease has this link to um, to mental decline, heart disease, but it also has links to digestive issues. So, chronic um, digestive issues like Crohn's and IBS and um, uh, celiac disease, and then also to autoimmune conditions. So, gum disease and autoimmune conditions, which are chronic inflammation, autoimmune conditions are just chronic inflammatory issues um, where the body is attacking itself. Well, that's what it's doing with gum disease. And if we really think about it, gum disease is actually just an autoimmune condition. And then so if we think of it that way and we see an, if they've got a, a thyroid auto, autoimmune issue or they've got a, a gut autoimmune issue like Crohn's or um, celiac disease, then we need to be thinking, why is this happening? And then you always find deficiency. You always find that these nutrients are deficient you find that they don't sleep well. And so you get to these underlying root causes, you fix the diet, you strip out the things that are affecting like the, the sugars, the vegetable oils and grains and so forth, and you get them on a nutrient-dense diet like 
meats and organs and bone broths and so forth. You get them sleeping better, so we're breathing through the nose. You give them a, a support. We get their tongue working better. Then their inflammatory markers start to come down, and sometimes you start to see that there's systemic markers of, you know, for instance, we've gotten rid of um, things like thyroid conditions, um, things like uh, digestive issues. They all start to repair because you're giving the body what it needs. It's just it's been screaming out in the mouth for some time. It's just that we, we've, we've been ignoring or being unable to read it. Unbelievable. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I've got pages and pages and pages of things, notes here. Uh, Stephen, I'm going to, because I can, and this is my platform to ask questions to experts, I've got teenage daughters, uh, one of which has just been told that she needs to get braces. And of course, she's saying, no way, never, it's not going to happen. Um, we've opted for Invisalign to see how that goes. But my question to our orthodontist was, are metals in the mouth these days? Obviously, mercury was a huge issue, again, a couple of decades ago. And hopefully, um, those people with those fillings are having them replaced. Yeah, that would be the best option, obviously, to get all the mercury out of your mouth. Yes, in, some, in certain situations, you, you have to know if there's any kind of conditions that we may have to step carefully with that but yeah it, for the most part um looking to replace them safely right and then for kids that as you say tooth decay shouldn't be happening but i'm sure all of our kids out there have you know one filling at least um from the school dentist and hopefully that encouraged them to brush their teeth <laughs> forever more what do we do about fillings obviously fillings aren't okay because there's a decay in the tooth but it's the best option still in dentistry? Uh, well, I mean, sometimes we have to fill, yes, if the decay is deep enough. So if decay is, is into enamel, there are opportunities to remineralize potentially. But um, if it goes deeper, yeah, we do need to restore. You don't want to be putting anything that's, um, that's interfering. So we don't want to be, if we can, try not to put metals in the mouth. For, for orthodontic treatments, sometimes we need metals and so forth for, um, you know, for a, 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 a temporary um, time. Um, but you don't want to put something permanently metal into the mouth when, when we don't. We have better options for that. The composite fillings aren't perfect either. They have BPAs and small amounts of BPAs, so um, and that they are hormone in interrupting. But they are you know probably better on the scale of um, restorative material. The best restorative uh, material are ceramics because it's it's like a porcelain. It's the most biocompatible, um, and so that's probably the the most like tooth structure. And you can actually get. It, it milled exactly to what your tooth is and, you know, a little, little bit more expensive and so forth. But for people looking to restore their mouth biocompatibly, um, ceramics are definitely the way to go. Okay. And so braces, yes, they are metals, or of course there's the, the clear plastic ones now. They're okay for a period of time. We're not going to get any heavy metal poisoning or anything like that? Well, I mean, like if you've got a kid with, or, or if you're considering braces, you want to make sure that metals aren't a problem for, with you to start with, you know, People with fungal issues and so forth may get kind of reactions to metals. Um, so you want to, most people are okay with it, but some people can have reactive, um, you know, kind of uh, issues, you know, inflammatory issues in the gums and so forth with metals. Um, rarer, you know, like for instance, titanium implants for the most part are fine for people, but the more biocompatible ceramic options um, are uh, much more, uh, much less inflammatory for the tissues, um, but. It depends on the patient, yeah, how we want to go with that because ceramics are a bit more fiddly. You will need good quality bones. So it's that kind of um, decision tree. Goodness me, lots of questions. All right, let's get to the basics then from brushing our teeth. And obviously we've talked a little bit about, well, a lot about mouthwashes being not a great idea unless you've got um, a safe one. Toothpastes, obviously lots of stuff in toothpaste that we need to consider. Uh, let's talk about, yeah, products that, that you recommend or um, what ingredients we should be looking at avoiding when it comes to our mouthwash and toothpastes. Yeah, look, I mean, I would be going down the road of um, of the, the toothpaste. I really like it having hydroxyapatite, so that's biological calcium. That's the remineralizing um, agent that I like to use, um, yeah, and I, that I use myself. Uh, mouthwashes, I don't generally recommend, you know, daily mouthwash. I think, you know, every now and again is okay, but you don't want to be putting something antibacterial in there every day because you're killing the bugs and you, you don't want to be doing that consistently. However, from time to time, if you've had a bit of an infection, you felt sick, like a low dose um, hydrogen peroxide um, here and there might be a good way to kind of control if you've got a little gum infection or something like that. Uh, but I wouldn't do that daily. Yeah, you want to try and um, encourage diversity in the bile, not kill 
buttons off all the time. Um, and then so things like salt waters are great. Um, I, I'd just be thinking too is that the nutrients are really what um, what are kind of uh, actually providing a protection. You're just kind of cleaning the, the surface levels off. So, um, yeah, natural toothpaste in a salt water rinse um, is, is a really great way to do that. Okay. And what about your xylitol gums? Yeah, you know, xylitol is okay. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't recommend it absolutely all the time as well because – seems to be some kind of – the literature is not really clear on it, but there seems to be some kind of um, effect on the oral microbiome as well. But I, I would say that it seems to be safe, but it may be not every day kind of um, get for that one. All righty. And tongue scraping. Are you a tongue scraper? Yeah, tongue scraping is good because you do get a build, a build up a plaque on the back of the tongue, and it's actually a good exercise too because with tongue scraping, so scraping right at the back there, and there's usually a gag reflex, you know, as you, get, as you start to move back – that's actually a good vagal tone activation. So like you can kind of use the, the tongue scraper as a way to desensitize your gag reflex and strengthen your vagal tone. All righty. So what should people be asking for when they go to their dentist next time, whether it be your, your everyday dentist that we've been going to for years or you've sought out a holistic dentist? Do people just hop in the chair and sit back and go, tell me, tell me what's going on in here. Tell me what I need to do. Well, it's actually a bit opposite to that. It's, it's more so they, we go through them telling their health journey. That's more how I find that the initial interaction goes. We, we, and I'm always asking questions. You know, I want to know everything. I want to know from what happened through their, you know, their early development years. If it's a child, we want to know birth stories. We want to know, um, pregnancy um, and even health issues in the mum. We're fine. We have to go to understand what's happening there. But then for, um, for older age groups and especially women, we want to find out what their pregnancy journey was like because we find a lot of these issues are noticed after they've had the kids when the kids are six or seven. Then all, all of a sudden the, the, you know, the lack of sleep and the lack of, you know, care for mum has really taken its toll. Um, and so we're trying to kind of get that story as to, you know, what happened during parenting and sleep and so forth. And then you usually find the problem when you, you hear how they've had to cope through life for, for for something and then how the body has reacted to that. So I find that going into kind of, you know, the um, the self-inflection with the patient is actually the, the most powerful way to find out what's really going on with them. My goodness, it really is dental therapy, isn't it? <laughs> and make a long appointment. <laughs> That's right, yeah, it's a long chat. It's, um, yeah, and we're trying to find out, yeah, you know, and then when you look at the mouth after a discussion like that, it's all very, it's very, very obvious. You know, we've got, we, we use technology to get a 3D scan up so we can see the airway and, and then you can see how the jaws developed and the story tells itself. Unbelievable, Stephen. It has been an absolute pleasure talking to you today. As I said, I was really excited about this chat because this is an, um, an area that since I started this whole aging project journey has been, um, really interesting. I think I've, as I said, I've deep dived into oral health more than any other topic, um, that we've had on the show so far. So if people want to do that, obviously they can find you at drstephenlin.com. You've got helixdentistry.com.au. Of course, your Instagram page is full of fabulous information. Um, your reels are terrific and so informative. And there is the dental diet, uh, as in the book, which is eating for optimal oral health. Oh, anything else you'd like to tell us before we go? Yeah, if, if they want to jump on and get um, those desiccated supplements, which I really recommend if they haven't, if they've had any of the issues we talk about, getting the organ supplements, the liver, heart and kidneys, a great combination. They can get them at helix slash well.com um, and then get the, the, the combination pack because it's, it's just a great way to connect into that ancestral eating. And a wonderful way to start your new oral health journey. Exactly. Besides your own book, what's one book that you've got on your bedside at the moment? Um, I've been, one that I read, I actually went back to um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahn, and that was one of my, one of my favourites. I was going back through that the other night, yeah, which is a, it, it's, it's one of my favourite reads, yeah, but it's, it's all about kind of deconstructing um, thought and, um, yeah, kind of psychological patterns that come up um, in people in, in life. It's, it's really interesting. Fabulous. We'll put that on our book club. Thank you. And do you have a quote or an affirmation? You're obviously in the wellness space um, and recognise that from an early age that there was so much more to health than what we were being taught traditionally. Um, are you a wellness kind of guy? Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. It's, it's kind of, that's been kind of the journey is like once you kind of get into this space, you can't really ignore it for yourself. And 
I'm the kind of person that kind of like, you know, I, 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 I act it before I'll, I'll tell it to patients so I can tell through personal journeys. And, you know, I've taught this to clinicians as well. It's like, you have to kind of walk the walk for it to really be genuine for patients and to, to and you have to kind of, you know, think about your know, personal experiences as well. So if you haven't done it yourself, you know, I'm raising kids on, on these pro, on, on, under these principles, you know, they don't eat, um, you know, we, we cut all the, the carbohydrates out. They eat a very animal based diet and these are young girls too. And yeah, the, it's working really well. Yeah. It's, it's, I think you have to live it in order to really help others to, to connect to that too. Fabulous. Thank you so much for your time today. Great connecting with you. Thanks, Shelley. You too. Dr. Stephen Lynn, thank you again for such an informative and thought-provoking conversation. Our guests are here to offer counsel from a professional point of view, and perhaps that point of view is a little bit different to the way that you have traditionally thought about healthcare. What we are hoping to do is inspire you to better health, and that can mean changing the way that we do things. I believe looking at my body as a whole and not just the sum of my parts makes sense, and you never know where the key or the clue to our best health may be hiding. Today we learned that that key to not only better cognitive health but gut health and heart health is also found in the mouth. I hope that you enjoyed today's conversation with Dr. Stephen Lynn. And as I said during our chat, I encourage you to follow him on all his platforms. He has some really, really great stuff to teach us. As always, the Aging Project podcast is for educational and entertainment purposes. Always seek medical advice from a qualified practitioner.